Hello and welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman. I have got a remote control, a large screen and a small computer that is loaded up with things that I want to share with you. But I want to start this show with a question. Ladies and gentlemen, here in the room, is there anyone here that would like a printer? <laughs> yes, but uh, a few people saying yes. Who was the nearest? I mean, it's probably the man in the middle there with the, the beard. Uh, what's your name there, sir? Stuart. Stuart. OK, Stuart. Uh, you would like a printer. I'll, I'll explain it. There's no catch. I'm offering you a free printer. It is an Epson stylus photo R800. OK, although I'm not sure why I'm showing you that, because this is the printer here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the printer that Stuart could be taking away tonight. OK. Uh, my only condition, Stuart, there's no real catch, there's only one condition, you're not allowed to sell it on or anything. I'm only offering it to you if you want a printer and you're going to use a printer. OK, it is a little old. Um, I couldn't find one for sale uh, in any major British retailer, but in the States, you can get one through Amazon.com where you will find a new one. It's available at $998. <laughs> And a second-hand one is available for $899.99. And basically, Stuart, I'm offering you a $1,000 printer for free if you want it, OK? <laughs> now, I'll be honest, I didn't buy it. It is an unwanted gift. I'm giving it away because I don't like it. And it's only fair, Stuart, before you take it off my hands, that I explain the drawbacks, OK? I used to have a lovely printer. I had it for 20 years. But after 20 years, having successfully printed something in the region of 40,000 sheets of paper, it sadly died. So I had to get a new one. Now, a few months ago, Mrs Gorman and I were visiting old family friends, and just as we were getting into the car to leave, I said, oh, but is there a computer shop near here? I need to get a new printer. I might as well do it while we're on the way home. And he said, oh, don't waste your money buying a new one. I've got one you can have. I've got two printers. I've got one I don't use. I said, you can't do that. But he insisted. And after a bit of toing and froing, I gave in. Now, at this stage of the game, I appear to be quite up on the deal. Not only have I got a $1,000 printer for nothing, I've also saved the 40 or 50 quid that I was going to spend on a new one. But then, I had to fill it up with ink. Now, with my old printer, that was a simple affair. It had two ink cartridges, black and colour. But the Epson Stylus Photo R800 doesn't have two ink cartridges. Oh, no, 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 no. It has two different black ink cartridges. It has photo black and matte black. It also has a red cartridge, a blue cartridge, a cyan cartridge, a yellow cartridge and a magenta cartridge, as well as something called Gloss Optimizer. And no, I don't know what that is either, but I suspect that David Cameron drinks it. <laughs> Incidentally, the only thing I've ever created that, if I was to print it, would require all those colours is that. <laughs> Nothing else ever in my life. If you go direct to Epson's own website, you can see that it does soon tot up. Basically, £17 a cartridge to fill that machine costs more than £130. I am living in a world where it costs me three times as much to fill my printer as my car. <laughs> He meant well, and it was a lovely gesture, but as presents go, it's like being given a puppy that only eats gold. <laughs> How expensive is printer ink? Let's think about a, a quantity we can understand, OK? Let's imagine, for example, uh, this, a standard jam jar, OK? Let's imagine that this was full of printer ink. We all see what that is. We all know what that looks like. How much would that cost if it was printering? Let's find out by referring to the various liquids price per jam jar chart, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All of these prices are in pounds. Now, if this jam jar was full of Dom Perignon vintage champagne, I think the cheapest it could possibly be is something around £70 pounds to fill that with that good champagne. If it was full of human blood, ladies and gentlemen, it would set you back around £123. Pounds. If this jam jar was full of the One Direction perfume, <laughs> you and I, that would cost you around £145. But if instead it was full of printer ink, it would cost you £598. <laughs> 600 quid! What the hell is this stuff? It's nearly nine times as expensive as vintage champagne. Why aren't they launching ships with printer ink to really show off? <laughs> If you run out of red ink, it's actually cheaper to open a vein. <laughs> which is what you want to do when you find out how much the cartridges cost. <laughs> I mean, 
Incidentally, I do not understand how a jam jar of One Direction scent could end up costing £145. Not when you can buy a jam jar of Harry Styles scent for as little as a tenner. On eBay, anyway. Yeah, look at that. Harry Styles fart in a jar. <laughs> £10. Mouse over image to Zoom. No, thank you. I don't think I'll bother. Quite happy as I am at this stage. The person selling this, the fart dealer, if you will, <laughs> describes it as 100% genuine. Harry farted in this jar for a laugh when we were younger, and I've just found it in the garage. <laughs> of course, if Harry denies it, then the law of fart rhymes proves he did indeed supply it. We know, <laughs> we know that much. On the other hand, if this man really is dealing it, the same laws suggest that he has smelt it. And I fail to see how he could do that and keep it in the jar. <laughs> but I digress. My friend called me a few weeks ago. He said, I just want to see how you're getting on with that printer. I was honest with him. I told him I was going to buy a new one as it was too expensive to run. And do you know what he said? He said, yeah, I found that as well. That's why I got rid of it. <laughs> Cheeky sod. So, before you decide, Stuart, I think it's only fair that you realise the printer's last two owners have been unhappy with it, OK? Now, to make matters worse, the printer won't print anything if just one of the inks is deemed as low, OK? I had to print my, my boarding card for a flight one time. I'm not going to tell you who I was flying with. Let's just say it used up an awful lot of orange ink. <laughs> Shortly after my return, I discovered that the printer had decided it was out of yellow ink. I didn't discover I was out of yellow because I was trying to print something yellow. I was trying to print a black and white document. But the printer refused because it was out of yellow. That's like going into a cafe and saying, I'll have a coffee, please, black, no sugar. And them saying, I'm so sorry, sir, we're out of milk. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense at all. This is my multi-ink biro. It ran out of red ink years ago. Guess what? The others still work. <laughs> this 90p biro is more sophisticated than this $1,000 printer. <laughs> Do you know who I think probably gets the most inconvenient presents of all? The Queen. The Telegraph love cataloguing the weird things she's been given. And as you can see, according to this piece, the weirdest thing she's ever been offered is horse sperm. If you don't believe me, here it is in white and black, ladies and gentlemen. She was on a trip to Ireland when a racing trainer offered to let one of the royal mares visit her stallion. This is a stallion that normally has a stud fee of £5,000 plus. Which means, by my reckoning, that a jam jar of horse seed... <laughs> ..based on an average horse ejaculate of a 50 mils would cost you 30 grand. That is off the chart. Literally, off the chart, <laughs> right, off the chart. <laughs> I've just had an awful thought. What if that is Gloss Optimizer? <laughs> oh, you can laugh, but I've heard that David Cameron drinks the stuff. <laughs> now, look, I, I keep getting distracted. The point here is to work out if Stuart wants this printer now that he's aware of its pitfalls. There is another option, Stuart. I have recently been given something else that I can't quite work out what to do with. You know, sometimes, if you're a performer, you might not know this, you, you turn up at a theatre, a venue, and there's a little present waiting for you in the dressing room. Well, tonight, there was a really weird present waiting for me uh, in the dressing room. I'll show you what it is. Um, I, was, I was most surprised. They've never done anything like this before. I don't know what was on their minds, uh, but it was that, ladies and gentlemen. My own sledgehammer. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to find a way of using it, but Stuart, I hate this printer. <laughs> <laughs> if by telling you about this printer's pitfalls, I have dissuaded you from wanting this printer, I could use my sledgehammer. The decision is yours, Stuart. I don't really think I can get it home on the train. You can't get it home on the train? The sledgehammer's bloody getting it. Right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. You all right, Phil? Careful through that door. Mind your feet, sir. There we go. <laughs> Health and safety. <laughs> oh. I'll see you after the break.
Modern Life is Goodish. My name is Dave Gorman, and tonight we've been mostly talking about inconvenient presents. I, I bought something as a present for someone special myself recently. I bought it on eBay, and I'm a bit concerned that the seller won't be able to send it to me in the post. I've looked at the rules of what you can and can't send in the post, and apparently flammable gases are not allowed. <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to get what I paid for. I think I've wasted a tenner on this. <laughs> It's a fascinating list of rules that the Royal Mail has compiled. All sorts of things that you can't send, and a few things that you wouldn't think are allowed, but it turns out they are. You cannot send, for example, uh, frozen water, uh, which includes packets of ice. <laughs> that asks more questions than it answers, doesn't it? <laughs> what other forms of frozen water were they imagining? You can't send waste, dirt, filth or refuse, which must be a bit of a kick in the teeth for these people. Um, <laughs> Because, essentially, that is what they do. A simple way to send a piece of shit in a box around the world. <laughs> I had no idea you can send live animals in the post. You can send a packet of bees to someone. <laughs> can you imagine anything more frightening than unwrapping a parcel of bees? Oh, I wonder what it is. Whatever you do, don't shake it. <laughs> You can't send gases, you can't send human or animal remains, but you can send bees. So it's okay to post bees, but not if they die or fart. <laughs> there are rules for sending bees. You must send bees first class as the minimum. I love the image of bees travelling first class. <laughs> I know it's more expensive, but we like the leg room. <laughs> You've got to be careful with bees these days. You're probably aware that the bee population has been diminishing. And bees are important. They don't just pollinate flowers, they are an important part of the food chain. Without the bees, we are all in trouble. And for some reason, in the last few years, bee populations have just been vanishing and nobody knows why. That's why there has been a lot of campaigning to get more people keeping bees. Which confuses me, because according to the Evening Standard a few years ago, the problem was that too many people were keeping bees. Celebrity beekeepers told to buzz off. Too many hives mean not enough food and falling honey yields. The fact that this was written up by the crime editor delights me. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine the main editor calling him up and saying, we've got a major sting operation we want you to look into. <laughs> <laughs> My question on reading this was, who are these celebrity beekeepers? I've never read anything about celebrity beekeepers. So I googled the phrase to see who they were and I found this. As you can see, The Guardian have handily compiled a list of the top ten best famous beekeepers. I'm sure we can all agree as a group that a beekeeper is someone who keeps bees. So surely a list of the ten best famous beekeepers ought to be the ten best people who are famous and who keep bees. Correct? Yeah. Right. Number one on the list, you can see his face there, is Vince Cable, who at the time was still an MP. This is the first sentence of the article. The business secretary and Liberal Democrat politician doesn't keep bees. <laughs> He's number one in your list of top ten best famous beekeepers. He doesn't keep bees. Also in the list, Suggs, the lead singer of Madness, and he gave up the hobby when all his bees died. <laughs> That's definitely not qualifying him for my list of the best beekeepers either. There are at least a couple of people in the list who are living and who are keeping bees alive also. My favourites are Martha Carney uh, from Radio 4 and Scarlett Johansson from Hollywood Films. We can tell that Martha Carney is a beekeeper because of the headwear. But we don't really know about Scarlett Johansson just from looking at that, do we? I, I kind of admire the Guardian picture desk for this. They've obviously asked them for pictures bee-related if they can. And someone's come back going, she's got a beehive. <laughs> Oh, yeah, all right, that'll do. We'll use that, OK. According to this article, Scarlett Johansson was given a beehive as a wedding present by Samuel L. Jackson, and Martha Carney was also given a beehive as a wedding present. When did that become a thing? <laughs> when did a beehive become an acceptable wedding present? Have they misunderstood what a honeymoon is? <laughs> to celebrate your union, I'm giving you a commitment to keep thousands of living creatures that might hurt you in a wooden box at the back of your garden. A beehive definitely qualifies for me as a stupidly inconvenient gift. How do you know someone wants to keep bees? I found an article that explains why Samuel L. Jackson thought that Scarlett Johansson wants to keep bees. In this article, he is quoted as saying, Scarlett, he said, 
was always talking about how the bees were dying and the planet was going to die. Bloody hell, you've got to watch your words around Samuel L. Jackson, haven't you? <laughs> Indian pythons are in danger, but I don't want him hearing me and then sending me one for Christmas. <laughs> Not that he would knowingly put a snake on a plane. Obviously, we, we know that. We know that. If you just say, I've heard the bees are dying, that's a problem, isn't it? That doesn't mean, at the next opportunity, could you give me some bees and a house for the bees to live in, please? <laughs> I got into all this, my head got into all this, after I'd read these articles. And a couple of days later, I was having dinner with my agent, and for want of something better to say, I just said, oh, this is really silly. Samuel L. Jackson gave Scarlett Johansson a beehive because she thought it was important to try and save them. And me and him, we talked about it for a little while, and we both chuckled at the ridiculousness of it, and I was absolutely as clear with him as I have been with you this evening. Now, when we're making this show, we have a little production office over the way, and next time I went in, after that dinner, I found a little present waiting for me at my desk. A beehive. <laughs> From my agent, I called him up and said, why have you given me a beehive? Three days ago, you and I had a conversation about how ridiculously inconvenient a beehive is as a present, and now you're giving me a bloody beehive. Do you know what he said? I thought you were dropping hints. <laughs> Makes no sense whatsoever. This is me and my beehive, right? That was taken, not at home, that's in the little garden next door to the office where I work. He's not even delivered it to where I live, which makes it doubly inconvenient. <laughs> to put that in context, this is what I look like when I turn up for work. <laughs> a beehive doesn't exactly fit in my saddlebags, does it? I think this is even more inconvenient a present than the bloody printer. But don't worry, I am not going to take a sledgehammer to the beehive. I've got plans for the beehive. But more on that later. Because, of course, we should talk about the other side of the coin. What, how do you avoid getting inconvenient presents? One thing you can do is create a wish list. You could just say to people, these are the things I would like, and you never know, people might just get them for you. If you are going to do that, my advice is this. Do not have Mylene Class be one of the people you're telling. <laughs> Mylene Class does not take kindly to people saying what they would like <laughs> as a present. Two of her daughter's classmates were having a joint birthday party and their mothers got in touch with all the other parents, basically saying, hey, our kids have decided they don't want, a, they want individual presents. They'd prefer a group present from the class rather than lots of little ones. You don't have to, but if you want to chip in a tenner, then we'll be able to get them what they want. As you can see, one of the girls wanted a Kindle and the other one wanted a desk. And you might be wondering, how did this end up in the Daily Mail? Well, that's because of Mylene. She seemed to think this was an outrageous thing for her fellow mums to do. She shared it all on social media and described the suggested donation as bonkers. And this caused much debate up and down the land. It was in all the papers, ladies and gentlemen. The Guardian were onto it, the Huffington Post were onto it. It was in the Independent and the Telegraph. It was everywhere. The comment sections were on fire as well. <laughs> and I am always fascinated when the bottom half of the internet gets stirred up like that. I've been to the bottom of the internet to find real comments from real people on this very topic. I've turned those comments into something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. Mylene is, as always, 100% correct about this situation. Whomsoever wrote that letter should be made to issue a public apology. If you ask me, she has just taken an innocent suggestion and twisted it spitefully to get some more media points. It's like that white bikini all over again. <laughs> Mylene class. Mylene no class more like. <laughs> By which I mean she has no class. <laughs> this story is obviously made up. No real child would ask for a desk. <laughs> My kids are 44 and 47, so this doesn't apply to me. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> they say that if you don't ask, you don't get. But it doesn't follow that if you do ask, you do get. I guess the facts are that if you ask, you sometimes get. <laughs> which is really the point of the saying. <laughs> but it looks like the girls in question won't be getting from Mylene Glass. For them, it has become a case of, if you do ask, you don't get what you asked for.
but you do get humiliated by Mylene Glass. <laughs> if my child asked for a desk, I would be concerned about what they were getting up to behind my back. <laughs> it's the ones who are all goody two-shoes to your face that end up doing drugs with soap stars and the like. <laughs> In the words of the song, come on, Mylene. <laughs> Too raw to Lou <laughs> I would never buy a child a desk as a present. It's like buying the wife a washing machine. Or perhaps a washer dryer. <laughs> Mylene made her name in the band Hearsay. Well, I've got some hearsay for you. Bog off, Mylene. <laughs> that isn't hearsay. That isn't what hearsay means. But yes, bog off, Mylene. <laughs> to Ra, to Lou Ryan. I thank you. For Bill Ross, Midnight Runners, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back after this short break. Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish, ladies and gentlemen. Now, while we have been talking about inconvenient presents this evening, I want to park that for a moment and talk about something else for a little while. Something that won't necessarily seem connected to begin with, but I promise you that by the end of the show, it will all join up. I want to talk about Twitter, and in particular, the way in which some people seem to treat it as some kind of online wishing well. I might well be proved wrong by history on this, but I don't think a retweet can change the world. But some people clearly disagree with me, like this chap, who, with good intention, tweets, global warming is a very real issue. The ice caps are melting. For the sake of our grandchildren, please retweet this to show you care. Hashtag global warming. Now, look, I care about global warming, and I know this man means well, but what is this achieving? What information is it spreading? What action is it prompting? Do you know what would happen if we all tweeted this? A little bit more global warming. <laughs> Electricity isn't free, computers aren't running on nothing. In some ways, it's actually a very dangerous thing to tweet. I mean, if Samuel L. Jackson reads it, you might get an ice cap for your birthday, <laughs> and nobody wants that. There are lots of people overestimating the power of a retweet. This is an account from someone who calls themselves Banksy. Now, you're a, if you're a fan of the graffiti artist, don't get excited. This isn't the real Banksy. As you can see, it is just a fan account. Anyway, he recently tweeted the following. For every retweet this gets, the World Wildlife Fund will donate 10p to help these animals. Hashtag endangered emoji. And as you can see, this has been retweeted 30,887 times. Which sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Because surely that means that this tweet has earned £3,088.70. Except, who has earned this money and where has it come from? Because according to the tweet, the money has been donated by the World Wildlife Fund, who I'm pretty sure are the people we're supposed to be donating money to. <laughs> Do 30,000 people think the World Wildlife Fund are actually giving 10p directly to some penguins? <laughs> they won't spend it wisely. This is like helping the Battersea dogs home by giving them a load of dogs. It doesn't mean anything. What's actually happened here is that the World Wildlife Fund have tweeted, we're using endangered emoji to save real animals for extinction, please retweet to sign up and help. But what they mean is that if you donate 10p, they encourage you to then retweet one of the emojis. That's entirely different. What this is, is 30,000 people who think they've done their bit because they've fallen for the idea that all you have to do is retweet something. Oh, yeah, I'm very active when it comes to the environment, me. I do my bit. Oh, really? What have you done? I retweeted something and the World Wildlife Fund gave some money to themselves. It's really easy. <laughs> it isn't just the power of a retweet that is so widely misunderstood. There are lots of other people who seem to misunderstand what Twitter can achieve. It's not always obvious when you see a single tweet in isolation. You need to see the wider context of someone's timeline to really understand what's going on. For example, 
Imagine you are a female celebrity. Say, say your former Spice Girl, Emma Bunton, and you get a tweet that looks something like that. At Emma Bunton. Would you consider getting gunged for a good cause? In isolation, that looks like a perfectly innocent tweet, doesn't it? Maybe this person is a, a member of the local round table. Maybe they're organising some big fundraising gala in town and he's been charged with the task of trying to get some celebrities involved and he's just wondering if being gunged is the kind of thing they might be up for. I imagine the BBC breakfast weather presenter Carol Kirkwood thought something pretty similar when she saw the tweet, would you do anything for charity, like gunging. And TV presenter Nikki Chapman must have thought something similar when she saw, at Nikki Chapman, would you get gunge for children in need. Although, I do like the fact that in this occasion, he's missed the D off of gunged. So it actually looks like he's asking her to pop to the shops and just pick some up on her way in. <laughs> Hi, Nikki, you wouldn't mind, we're gunging Emma Bunton in a bit. Would you pick up some gunge on your way in? It's for children in need. Thanks ever so much. Now, any of these tweets looks perfectly innocent in isolation. But when you look at his timeline, you can see that it's not necessarily all that simple. He starts to look just a little bit obsessed with gunge. <laughs> These are 21 successive tweets, all sent on the 24th of June. Only one of them mentions charity, while every single one of them mentions gunge. <laughs> I say that, that's not actually strictly speaking true. 20 of them mention Gunge, one of them doesn't, it's this one. Uh, it's addressed to Australian radio presenters Kyle and Jackie O, and it says, get Jackie O slimed. <laughs> and slime, you might have worked out, is what Australians call Gunge. <laughs> now, lots of people are a bit obsessed with Gunge. For some people, it is a part of their sexual psyche. There is a recognised sexual fetish called wet and messy. It is also known as Wham, as you can see. A form of sexual fetishism whereby a person becomes aroused when copious amounts of a substance are applied to the naked skin, face or to clothing. Now, as far as I'm concerned, consenting adults can get their kicks any way they like. But it is a bit weird that gunge occupies this strange place in our culture. Gunge basically exists in three places. It is often found in kids' TV. <laughs> and it's often done for charity. And obviously, there is often some crossover between the two. But there's also this other world of wet and messy fetish. And they like all of the same things. And whether you like it or not, there is some crossover. You can't stop there being a crossover. If someone is turned on by gunge, then they are turned on by gunge. If someone gets turned on by seeing people chop vegetables, then Ready Steady Cook is going to get them frisky. There's nothing <laughs> Ainsley Harrier can do to stop that. Now that you know about the world of Wham, it probably casts a new light over Gunge Man's tweets. <laughs> Sometimes he's not really asking anything. For example, on these four occasions, his tweets read, Get Gunge. <laughs> and when he tweets Isla Fisher, the only word he can make out is, Gunge. <laughs> I suspect he's using the word charity as some form of camouflage. I think he thinks that that makes his question seem more innocent than it really is. But even when he's doing that, he sometimes gives himself away. Like with this tweet to Chloe Maidley. At Chloe Maidley, would you like to be gunged for charity? In jeans. <laughs> Doesn't in jeans give it away? Why would anyone working for a charity care what fabric was clinging to the legs of their willing gungee? To loose women's Andrea McLean, would you like to be gunged for charity? In tight jeans. <laughs> Answer. A bit demanding, isn't it? And he returns to Emma Bunton saying, Would you like to be gunged for charity? In tight <laughs> jeans! Answer, Emma! I don't know about you, but I'm starting to suspect that he's gunging his own jeans while he's typing these. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he has got a bit of a thing for gunge. And jeans. <laughs> I'm certain he's got a thing for jeans, as these six consecutive tweets will attest. Davina McCall. Davina, why don't you wear jeans on TV? Why? Christine Bleakley, why don't you wear jeans on TV? Amanda Holden. Amanda, why don't you wear jeans on TV so much? Why? Emma Willis. Emma, will you wear jeans on eviction night? Ruth Langsford. Ruth, why don't you wear jeans on TV so much? Why? Now, look. I don't want to give you the impression that this man just harasses famous women about jeans and gunge. I mean, I do think this is real harassment of real women, but that's not the only thing he does. It's only fair to him that I point out that he does sometimes tweet men as well. For example, he tweets Eamon Holmes here. Would you enjoy your wife Ruth Langsford getting gunge on this morning? I think you should do it. <laughs> 
Now, when people are selling your jar farts for a tenner, it's obvious that your online life is going to get pretty weird. I know Harry Styles' life has plenty of other compensations, but he is dealing with an extraordinary level of fame. Just look at how the world responds to his tweets. This is a sample tweet from Harry Styles. Everyone who came to the tour so far, thanks for having us. We had a great last show in Dubai. Huge thanks to all the crew, all the love. That is a nice sentiment, and that has been retweeted 208,813 times. Good luck to everyone doing exams at the moment. Hope they're going well so far. Kiss, kiss. That's lovely, isn't it? He knows his audience. He's looking out for them. He knows what they're going through. Well done, him. And that has had 221,460 retweets. It's nice, I think, that he uses his enormous level of celebrity to shine a light on big issues from time to time. Thinking about everyone involved in the earthquake in Nepal. Such awful news. 191,407 retweets. But you've got to put these numbers in context. These are nice tweets that people wanted to spread. How many retweets would he get if he was to just tweet two random words? Like, you know, for example, baby metal. <laughs> that was retweeted 123,014 times. That is the background radiation of that level of fame. Very few people on Earth enjoy that level of fame. I mean, when Eamon Holmes tweets just two random words, like, for example, Portugal girly. <laughs> that only gets 282 retweets. Before tonight. <laughs> <laughs> By my calculations, I think that makes Harry Styles 436 times as famous as Eamon Holmes. And that's something I think we all need to have a good long think about. So let's do that, and I'll see you after the break. To modern life is good, ladies and gentlemen. Now, earlier on, we were talking about inconvenient gifts. But we took a diversion for a while in order to talk about a kind of maniacal use of Twitter. About people who think they can change the world by asking you to retweet something or achieve some weird fantasy goal by just tweeting and asking for it. Now, there is a reason I was talking about that. Now, one thing we know already is that I have a beehive. A beehive that I was given but that I don't want. And I have come up with a plan to get rid of my beehive. A plan that I'm calling Plan B. <laughs> my plan is to take inspiration from those people I was discussing earlier. I'm going to take my inspiration from people like Global Warming Man, the man who thinks that a retweet will solve a problem. I'm going to take my inspiration from people like Gunjman, who tweets Emma Bunton asking over and over again if she wants to be gunged. I'm going to take my inspiration from Samuel L. Jackson man. <laughs> As you know, I think if you tweet about a thing like global warming, you should do something about it. I think if you retweet it, you should do something about it. And I have done something. I have created a Twitter account called Bees Are Good. Save the bees. Which, incidentally, is a good thing to do. The bees should be saved. My biography says, bees are good, bees are good, uh-uh, British bees are good. Right? <laughs> That's my bio on Twitter. And just like Global Warming Man, the way I'm going to tell people they can save the bees is simply by retweeting a message with the hashtag, save the bees. And I'm also going to be just like Gunge Man. I'm going to pursue every celebrity I can. And as soon as I get one celebrity retweeting me, I'm going to take my inspiration from Samuel L. Jackson and I'm going to send them a bloody beehive. <laughs> Because they obviously want to save the bees or they wouldn't have retweeted hashtag save the bees, would they? That's how it works according to Samuel L. J., isn't it? So I tweeted a whole load of celebrities, hundreds of them. For example, I tweeted Kelly Brook with a tweet saying, at Kelly Brook, please retweet, help us save British bees. Retweet this to hashtag save the bees. Buzzing. Nothing. I tweeted the snooker player, Willie Thorne. <laughs> Nothing going, not a retweet, nothing at all. I tweeted Eamon Holmes. I imagine he's too busy with his Portugal girly. Nothing going on there from Eamon. I tweeted Justin Timberlake, or should I say Justin Tim B Lake? Not falling for it, not crying a river. No, nothing happening with Justin. No retweets. I tweeted Christine Hamilton, the wife of disgraced former MP Neil Hamilton, who's now involved with UKIP. Oh, could you please help us save British bees? Please retweet. Hashtag save the bees. Let's get this hashtag buzzing. Thanks, Christine. 
Maybe, maybe it's the appeal to save British bees that appeals to Christine, who calls herself Brit Battleaxe. Will British bees appeal to the very British Christine Hamilton? Yes. Yes, they will. <laughs> Christine Hamilton retweeted my Save the Bees tweet. Christine Hamilton has just earned herself a bloody beehive she doesn't want. <laughs> And even more perfectly, she retweeted it on the 4th of June this year. And the 4th of June, I learned from Twitter, also happens to be her wedding anniversary. <laughs> Happy anniversary, hubs. And we already know that the beehive is the perfect wedding gift. <laughs> so why not the perfect wedding anniversary gift for the Hamiltons as well? It's like life is conspiring to underline how right Plan B is. To send her the beehive, I've obviously got to find an address for her, and luckily the political classes tend to be quite easy to track down. I found an address in Battersea, southwest London, for her. Uh, now, just in case you don't know who the Hamiltons are, let me explain. Christine's husband, Neil, used to be the Conservative MP for Tatton in Cheshire. Now, I've got to be honest with you here, I have had a bit of a row with the show's lawyers over this. It turns out I'm not allowed to say what I was going to say about the Hamiltons. So I will give you the legally sanctioned words instead. Neil Hamilton lost his seat in Tatton following the Cash for Questions scandal in the 90s. He's been back in politics since 2011 with the UK Independence Party, though recently, after a letter was leaked to the papers, he was reported to have been involved in a contretemps with the party over his expenses. One of the alleged issues related to nights spent at his wife's flat, which some of the papers have described as being in Battersea. So... I was ready to send Christine Hamilton a beehive. But just to check, I sent her a tweet saying, thanks so much for the retweet, Christine. Is your Battersea address the right place to send your complimentary beehive to? <laughs> I think, and I think your reaction backs me up on this, that a rational person would think, what do you mean, my complimentary beehive? <laughs> what are you on about? All I said was I think the bees should be saved. I didn't say I want a beehive. Christine Hamilton didn't say that. What Christine Hamilton did was start following Save the Bees on Twitter and then sent me a direct message saying, uh, actually, this is our address in Wiltshire, that would be better. <laughs> <laughs> nothing I could do. In her head, there is nothing weird about someone just giving her a free beehive. <laughs> Happy to have it, but would rather I sent it to their place in the country. Which is a bit annoying, to be honest, because I live in London. <laughs> I don't really want to go to Wiltshire with a beehive. This thing's been inconvenient enough. So what I did was ignore that message. <laughs> <laughs> I pretended I hadn't seen it, and I just delivered the beehive to her Battersea address anyway. That is me there with the beehive in the back of a van. It's in the cardboard box. Uh, that's me disguised as a delivery driver so that I don't arouse any suspicions. This is inside her apartment block. That is her front door. That's me with the beehive. I knocked on, gave it a go. I waited a minute or two, and then I scarpered, leaving that outside the front door. <laughs> And then I sent her a little cheeky tweet saying, Hi, Christine, saw your direct message too late. It was a little cheeky fib from me, that one. Uh, the beehive was delivered to your Battersea address this afternoon. Hope that's OK. And she came back saying, Help! No one there. No porter, no nothing. Might be outside flat when we go, but not until next Monday. Fingers crossed. Not, no, I don't want a beehive, but... <laughs> oh, no, I hope I don't lose my free beehive. <laughs> So I sent her a message saying the delivery guys, that's me, <laughs> say they got it to your front door, should be OK. At which point she was very happy and I was very confused. <laughs> because I think, isn't a beehive obviously a really inconvenient gift? I didn't want someone thinking, brilliant, I'm getting a free beehive. I wanted someone else to experience the inconvenient, I don't want the bloody beehive feeling that I had experienced. So I thought, what else can I do to get a rise out of Christine? And I thought, I know, I know. I'll send her some bloody bees. <laughs> now, that there is Battersea. That's where their flat is. That is where I have left the hive. And that there, roughly speaking, is Wiltshire. That's where they live. It's about 100 miles away. Guess where I'm going to send the bees? <laughs> <laughs> My next tweet to Christine... More importantly, I have the right address now. Your free bees went in this morning's post. <laughs> and as we all know, you can send bees in the post. <laughs> 
But there are rules. First class as a minimum, we know that. You've got to put urgent living creatures handle with care on the package and you've got to write the sender's name and address on the package as well, which was a bit of a problem for me because I didn't really want Christine having a route back to me from the parcel. So what I did is this. That there on the top, you can see that's the Wiltshire address, obviously blocked it out on the telly. I've put urgent living creatures handle with care on the box as well. Down here, that there is the return address. And what I've put down there is their address in Battersea. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want it. Send it back. No, don't send it back. <laughs> now, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I did think it would be a funny idea to send her a parcel of bees. But when I came to it, I suddenly thought, I have no idea how to get some bees. <laughs> and if I can get some bees, I don't know how to persuade them to get in a box. <laughs> I also thought, I know you're allowed, I know it's OK, apparently, according to the rules, to send bees, but I'm not sure that it should be. I don't know that that's very nice for the bees. It feels like it might be a cruel thing to do. And then I thought, in many ways, an empty parcel that says it contains bees is better. <laughs> it's got all of the shock of, you've got a parcel of bees, with extra added, fucking hell, where have all the bees gone? <laughs> added into the mix, hasn't it? <laughs> How would you react if a parcel of bees turned up at your door? You wouldn't like it, would you? That would be a bit of an intimidating parcel to receive, surely? This is how Christine reacted. Yippee! <laughs> Just look what bees are good have sent me. Fabulous parcel of beautiful bees. <laughs> Hashtag now what do I do? It is impossible! <laughs> it is impossible! <laughs> Completely impossible to get a proper reaction out of Christine Hamilton. She is unfazed by everything. I didn't think I would say this, but in all honesty, I think I love Christine Hamilton just a little bit. <laughs> I love the way she just takes everything in her stride. Well done, her. And it must be obvious to you that this story didn't go the way that I thought it would. Perhaps even the way that I hoped it would. I was just trying to stir a bit of chaos into the world. But you can't do that with Christine Hamilton. It's all just water off a duck's back for her. But you know what? With hindsight, I am glad it ended the way it did. Because I think everything happens for a reason. I'm glad that she wants a beehive. And she does want it. I know this is going to sound far-fetched, it's genuinely true. I have proof that she wants the hive. Genuinely, this evening, half an hour before I stepped into the studio this evening, she tweeted the following. Beehive in situ, just waiting for some action. Please, bees are good, what do I do now? <laughs> she wants a beehive, and you know what? She wants it so much and she's put it in a nice place. I am going to arrange to send her some real bees as well. We need to save the bees, after all. Something good has come out of this. In fact, two good things have come out of this. Christine Hamilton's going to get a beehive, some more bees are going to be in the world, that's a good thing. But also, I've now won a little argument with our lawyers. Because now, thanks to Christine Hamilton, there is no reason on earth why I shouldn't say that the Hamiltons love free bees. <laughs> Just as long as you spell it right in your head. Thanks for watching. Good night.